Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Sound Design for Video Games. Today we're going to be creating a complete car engine sound inside of MetaSounds. We're going to be using the samples that we've created already in the previous episode. Once we've created this meta sound, we're then going to be going into the player controlled blueprints area. We're going to go to the event graph and we're going to go over how we communicate with that meta sound to get it working correctly inside of the game. Now the first thing you're going to want to do is export all of these engine audio samples that we created in the previous episode. So you can see here I have an engine rumble 90, an engine rumble 100, 125, 150, 175 and it goes all the way up to 500. So take a good look at these numbers. These are the frequencies that we're going to be exporting the engine rumble at. And of course also export the engine tick sound we created with the white noise and we transient shaped it. So I'll go into how we actually export that and get the correct frequencies now. Inside of Cubase, you want to highlight our little loop of brownie and noise here. Go to Snap Heap, and what I want you to do is get rid of the LFO. So just for now, we're going to have the engine sound be very flat. The reason we're doing this is because we are going to add an LFO inside of Unreal Engine shortly. Now the next thing you're going to do to get the desired frequencies exported, I want you to go get a frequency analyzer. Now as we bring up these filters up and down, what's going to happen is we're going to be spotting certain resonance points. So obviously our first frequency will be around 90 hertz. So you can see here, this peak here, this, our, this is our resonance frequency is approximately 90 hertz. It doesn't have to be perfect, just get as close as possible. Now the next one would be 100 hertz. So we're gonna move this control up until this lowest frequency is right on this line essentially. So I'll demonstrate that now. So that's not quite there. It's getting there. I think we need to go a little bit lower. So that's quite close. As I say, it doesn't have to be perfect, just get as close as possible. And all you're going to be doing with this engine rumble sound is going up and up and up until you get to about 500 hertz, at which point you'll have all of those loops exported and ready to use inside of Unreal Engine. Now for the engine tick, there's a big issue you'll run into. One of the problems is this is quite a transient sound and we are heavily processing this. You can see we've got a very tight filter here. We've got high passes, we've got a, a transient shaping happening here. And what that is going to result in it is if you try and export this MIDI by itself, you're going to end up with a situation where the first part of the sound is going to have a little click. So when you loop this, every time that loop goes right back to the start, you're going to hear that click inside of your racing game, which is of course what we don't want because that will allow our ears to hear that it's a loop. So what you need to do is you need to highlight this and there's different ways of doing this in each digital audio workstation. If you press control right click on Cubase, you can export this in place. Let me just look for that right now. Oh, there we go. So render in place here, render with current settings, or you can select your own settings. As I say, in each DAW, it's a little bit different. Once you've got that rendered, it should pop up here. So we've got that in audio instead of MIDI. So I'm going to solo this now, unsolo that. And what I've done is I've actually cut this a little bit later. So if I go back here, you can see the problem. You can see how bigger, how much larger these waveforms are compared to the rest of them. So as that comes back around with the loop, that is going to be too loud essentially. And we'll hear it as a loop rather than hearing it as something that is just seamlessly looping. So you'll have to essentially chop any bits away, which look a little bit odd so that you have something like this, which is going to loop flawlessly. Export that out, get that into Unreal Engine, and we'll be ready to start. Now, if you didn't follow along with the previous episodes and you didn't create your own samples, I do suggest that you go ahead and watch those videos and go and create your own samples because it's going to give you a much better knowledge of sound design. But if you haven't got time for that, you want to get straight into this video, that's fine. You can go ahead and grab the sound design light version of the racing game. 
completely for free. That's essentially got enough assets in there that you can get through the entire course. Um, if you want the full version, everything that we're going to be using throughout this course, this will cost £10. That's a really great way of supporting the channel. Now with all that out of the way, what you should have exported and imported into Unreal Engine is all of your engine rumble sounds and your engine tick sound. So you can see here, I have a SW underscore engine rumble 90, 100, 125, 150, 175, 200, 250, 300, 350, 400, 466, 500, and finally an engine tick. Now with that, we are ready to start going through the meta sound. Let's go to the far left here of our meta sound and the first thing I want to go over are these trigger plays and trigger stops that we're doing. So you can see on these wave players it receives a trigger play and it receives a trigger stop. This is going to tell obviously the wave players to play or stop. The benefit of this is essentially we won't be running into issues where for instance all of these sounds are playing all the time even if we can't hear them. So what we want to do is we want to set up some functionality to make sure that if you can't hear a sound from a wave player, then it should be stopped. If you should be hearing the sound, then it should be played. So we're doing that with trigger pulses. So the way you create these is by dragging off here and you can say promote to graph input. Once you've done that, you'll have something that looks like this. If you press F2, you can then name it. My naming convention is a little bit probably overly descriptive but I've named mine trig for trigger underscore one dash two that's letting me know that these wave players which have loaded in our engine rumble sounds is going from the range of 100 hertz to 200 hertz this one being the exception that goes to 90 which is our idle engine sound so essentially that's why we've named it that so that I can identify that this is this range of RPM sounds that we're dealing with. Now the play is getting attached to the play of each of these wave players. Now what we want to do is also have a trigger stop for this batch of wave players. So we have a trigger stop, it says trig underscore one dash two underscore range underscore stop. This is then going into a trigger delay which is being held for 0.25 seconds to so 25 milliseconds. The reason for that is to do with the way we are crossfading the sound. So you can see here we're crossfading the sounds of each of these individual wave players in and out and they're being crossfaded over the time of 25 milliseconds using the interp2 node here. So essentially by the time this batch of sounds should not be heard this is getting brought down to zero and by the time this interp2 has truly made the value coming out of here zero into our mixers, what's going to happen is once we absolutely cannot hear it, that is when this trigger stop will be released through to the stop of each of these wave players. That way we don't risk the player ever hearing that a wave player randomly stopped because you're only triggering that stop once the crossfade section has made that volume completely zero. Now let's go over our wave players. Now this is the section where on our previous episode when we created the smaller scale engine system we weren't using wave players we was using uh, tone generators so we were using like the sawtooth wave, the square wave, the sine wave. Instead of using that we're using wave players. The beauty about these is you can actually load in a real car engine sound and it will work flawlessly with this meta sound. Now we created our own synthetic engine sound and what we have loaded into here, the wave asset area, is our, if I type in sound wave engine and you see engine rumble and you see we have all of the engine rumble sounds that we will have exported from Cubase or your digital audio workstation of choice. So you can see we have 90, 100, 125, 150 as we showed you before. Essentially these go up those ranges sequentially. So this one will be 90, this one will be 100, this one will be 125 and if I go all the way to the bottom it should be 500. So you should be able to read there SW underscore engine rumble 500. 
Now most of these wave players are going into a pitch shift area and then a crossfade area before going into the mixer to be processed in terms of their gains using the crossfade section. With the exception being this which is the engine idle sound, that's got no pitch shift because we don't intend to pitch shift it. And then we have got the crossfade section so that essentially it's going to come in and out as the RPM goes up and down. Now let's go over this pitch shift section here and I'm not going to go into too much detail because we already went over this in the previous episode when we created a smaller scale version of this. So if you watch that episode this should be very familiar to you. The main difference is we're using one graph input to essentially influence the pitch shift of this delay pitch shift. I'm just going to set this back to zero. So essentially we're using this one graph input which we've named pitch shift. You can see if I move it, every single one moves which is what we want because we just want one graph input to control the pitch shift of all of these because it just keeps things a little bit simpler. Pop that back to zero again. Now this maths here, if you want to understand why these numbers are the way that they are, I do suggest that you go and watch the previous episode. But just in case you have to just sort of do a monkey see, monkey do sort of thing, that's fine. I'll sort of scroll down here and show you how each of these is set up. So we have this one here, and this one, and as we get further down, you'll see we've added an extra section here where it goes 0.5 which is to do with the ratio between the 2000 RPM and the 3000 RPM. And then it becomes 0.33 here, and then 0.25, and eventually 0.2 when we're at the 5000 RPM here. So once again, I'm not going to go into too much detail about this because it is something that we did cover in the previous episode with the smaller scale. Now for the crossfade logic, again, we have already gone through this with the smaller scale meta sound we created in the previous episode. We have a graph input here, which we've named CF time, which stands for crossfade time. This is the same graph input here and here and here, which essentially means when this changes, it changes all of them, including this section here with our trigger inputs. So when I move this, let's say I make it 0.77, if I go over here, you can see all of these now equal 0 0.077. Just change that back now. There we go. So what's essentially happening here is the interp2 is taking a value off this side, which will be set to one when we want to hear it, and then it will crossfade it down to zero over the course of 25 milliseconds. That's essentially what's happening here. And we have exactly the same thing for all of these. I'll just scroll down so that you can see them. You can see it's basically a copy and paste job. The only difference being that we have a unique graph input for each of these. And it's important to name these appropriately. So you can see I've named this one 90 vol because it's the volume of the 90 hertz signal. I've named this one 100 vol, 125 vol, 150 vol, all the way to up to... 500 volt. So that's going to allow us to easily communicate with it later on when we get to the event graph section because it's easy to remember what the name of it is. Then what we're doing is we are bringing all of these into these mono mixers. So we have a mono mixer 6 and 7 and we're using this to essentially bring together all of these wave player sounds and how they're being processed with the pitch shift and the crossfade. Once all of those are joined using these mono mixers, we're then going into an area I've called the high shelf fizz control. And essentially what we have is a graph input here, which I've named eng fizz. This graph input has a range of zero all the way up to 36. I don't believe we ever go that high. And that is attached to the gain of this bi quad filter. The cutoff frequency is 2000, the bandwidth is 0 0.3, and we have it set to a high shelf. So essentially, as this engine fizz control comes up, it's going to increase the amount of energy above 2000 Hz. The idea is the higher the RPM, the more high frequency energy I want from all of these noise, these engine noise samples that we've created. So we're getting that sort of dynamic response from the noise elements of the engine. That's what's going on here with the fizz control. 
Now coming out of the high fizz control here, we're going straight into another mono mixer. I'm just going to follow along this top part of the mixer first. So what we have coming into here is essentially all of this, these wave players essentially being mixed in to this mixer here. And what we are doing is we're coming out of the linear gain zero into a multiplier. The bottom half of this multiplier is a simple graph input. We call that engine noise volume. That's essentially going to allow us to easily control the engine noise volume relative to what's down here, which we'll get into in a moment. Now, the other side of this multiplier, we're going up into an LFO section. First thing we're going into is an interp2, which is there to smooth out the effects of the LFO as it makes the sound loud and silent. Then what we're going into is the interp time section here. So out of the interp time, we have a float to time conversion, and then we have a graph input, a float graph input called engtrem smooth which stands for engine tremolo smooth. We're smoothing out that tremolo effect to essentially make it less helicoptery. Out of the target section, we're going into an LFO. We have the shape set to um, a saw wave. Um, we have the max value one. So that means the maximum value the LFO is gonna go, go up to is one, standing for 100% volume. Um, and these, I think, are just the default settings, if I'm not mistaken. The frequency, we've set that to 9. Now, I did have a comment on the previous episode where someone said, could I make this essentially work by the frequency of the actual car engine? So, for instance, when we are idle, this would be 9 because of 90 hertz. If we are going 5,000 RPM, we'd want this to essentially be... Um, 50 and essentially you could have the engine tremolo rate change with the car engine sound that was someone who commented that that's a really good idea actually I haven't got that in this system but you could easily implement that um, so yeah that's the engine tremolo rate it's a graph input we have that set to a default value of 9 going into the frequency of the LFO but just an idea from one of the comments which I thought was quite quite a good idea you could have that set to the tremolo rate of the actual RPM of the vehicle. You just need to do some simple maths to essentially make that value make sense, essentially. The next thing I'm gonna talk about is the engine trem depth, which essentially stands for engine tremolo depth. It's a graph input, a float graph input, and we have that set to 0.15. So what that means is it means with a rate of nine, this LFO is oscillating to 15% volume at its quietest, and 100% volume at its loudest. So that is essentially the LFO section, which is eventually being multiplied by the overall volume that we want, and then going into gain zero. Now let's talk about what's coming up the bottom half of this mono mixer. So you can see here out of the little pink pin here, which is an audio pin, we're coming out into another wave player. And in this wave player, you should be able to see what we have is the SW underscore engine underscore tick. So this is our tick sound. Um, to trigger this wave play, we're just using a basic on play. So anytime we press play or anytime this is inside of our inside of our car and we actually play the game, what's going to happen is this is going to fire off and cause this wave player to play. Um, coming out of here, obviously straight into the mono mixer, and in the linear gain, we have an engine tick vol. That's our graph input. It's a custom graph input, and uh, that's what we've named it. We've set that to 1.7, so that's 170% volume. And obviously we set this one to 3, so 300% volume. That's how we're mixing the engine noise, which is over here. So all of these are our engine noise, eventually all coming together here at 300%, and then our engine tick sound is being mixed together at 170%. Now coming out of this little engine tick mix section we've just been through, where we're eventually going is to the end here, to this master volume. So we're gonna get to this in a moment. What I wanna do, just to sort of teach this in a way which I think seems a lot more linear going from left to right of our graph here. I'm going to go over the synth section first. We're going to build all of this 
build all of this, go into this molly mixer, and then eventually we'll get to this master volume section. So here is the synth section. We have three sawtooth waves and a triangle wave. I ended up not using the triangle wave, so if you want, you can leave that out. If you want to experiment, by all means, put it in as well. And then we have some graph inputs here going into multipliers. We have some maths here, which I'll go into shortly. And then we have some processing here, which is essentially processing how these synths sound based on what we're doing with the vehicle. So let's start here. So get your three sort of waves created and your triangle wave if you want a triangle wave as well. Out of this, we're going into a multiplier of 0.5. So this is the frequency of this sort of wave into a multiplier of 0.5. Then what we have is this graph input here that we've created called eng sin pitch, engine synth pitch. We've set that to 90 for 90 hertz. That is going to be influenced in our event graph of our player controlled blueprints. So essentially as the RPM goes up, the frequency of the synth will go up. We have exactly the same thing here, except we're not using 0.5 as the multiplier, we're using one. So why have we got 0 0.5 and 1? 0 0.5 is halving the frequency and 1 is keeping the frequency the same. So these two sort of waves are exactly the same. The only difference being that, it, that 1 is an octave lower than the other. So we have a nice octave of sort of waves here. Now out of this third sort of wave, it gets a little bit more complicated. I'll explain this as best as I can. We're going into a multiplier. Out of the top of this multiplier, it's exactly the same. So we have 0 0.5 because we want this to be an octave lower than 90 hertz. So our engine synth pitch, these are all the same graph inputs into 0 0.5, making it an octave lower into the multiplier and then the frequency. Now, what I wanted to do was I wanted to create um, a sort of wave which played a harmonic, like a harmony with these two sorts of waves. So rather than playing 90 hertz, this one is set to 90. It's being halved, so that's 35. And then we have a multiplier. And then we're going into this little bit of maths here. And then we have a, a graph input. So this graph input, due to these maths here, going into this multiplier, essentially makes this graph input work like semitones. So I can change this. If I press play, you should be able to hear it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set that back to minus six. So essentially this is operating like semitones due to this multiply here. I'll demonstrate that right now, why that works the way that it does. What we have is an input frequency, a conversion, a semitone section, and then the output frequency. So if I double click on this, you can see we are taking the input frequency, multiplied by, in brackets, the conversion multiplier, multiplied by the semitones, and then we're adding one at the end to make this work correctly. So if I change this to say 0 0.2 semitones, that would equal 101.66 hertz. If I change this to 12, which would be an octave, then this should equal 200, because 200 hertz is an octave higher than 100 hertz. And you can see that's exactly how that works. So hopefully that makes sense why we have this value in the graph section of our meta sound. So now hopefully after that explanation, it makes sense why we have this multiplier here going into this addition node. Once again, just to be absolutely certain, we're all on the same page. This is a graph input. You make that by doing this. Drag off, promote to graph input. We've named that eng sin underscore free, underscore pitch mod, because what it does is it essentially modulates the frequency we're receiving here by multiplying all of this at the end of here, eventually going into the frequency node. We've got exactly the same thing happening here with this one. Once again, I'm not using the triangle wave, so it's up to you if you want to use that. I do want to highlight this little addition node going out of it. So if you, what you wanted to do was you wanted to create a little bit of dissonance at the start of this coming out, you can add an addition node and just use very small values like I have here. I've used 0 0.05, so that's just going to 
augment the frequency just a little bit and give us that little bit of dissonance if that's what you want to do. Now let's go over to these bi-quad filters and essentially the idea is these are going to process the sound differently based on what we're actually doing with the vehicle. So we'll go over that now. So with these bi-quad filters, all of these are set to low passes. So we're essentially allowing only a certain amount of low frequencies through. Sawtooth waves are very harmonically rich. They've got lots of very piercing high frequency sounds. So ultimately what we're doing is we're basically using the low pass to take off the edge of those sounds. We have a graph input on this cutoff frequency, which I've named as follows. We have a bandwidth graph input here, which I've named like this. We set that to one. These graph inputs, which are going into the cutoff frequency, these are all being processed differently. I'll go over this clamp in a minute. These are all being processed, once again, based on what we're doing with the vehicle. So as the RPM goes up, what we're doing is we're essentially allowing the cutoff frequency to go up. So essentially the low pass is allowing more and more high frequencies to come through the sound. So it's going to start off very, very um, warm sounding when you're at your engine idle sound. But then when you get to those higher RPMs, the filter is going to open up and let more high frequencies through. That's essentially what's happening here. I'll speak briefly about this clamp node here. What that essentially does is it basically makes it so that it will clamp it between a minimum of 350 and a maximum of 2500. So if we're feeding the engine rotation speed from this vehicle and we're taking a value and that's influencing this, if this ever goes above essentially this value, the clamp will stop it from going above. If it ever goes below this value, which I believe is impossible because I've set it here as a minimum range, but just in case it's not, if it ever does go below the value of 350, it won't be allowed to. So that's essentially what the clamp float is doing. It's clamping those values so that it'll never go above that value and it will never go below that value as it's being fed into the cut off frequency. Then we're going into another bi-quad filter, but this time we're using a high pass. Now the high pass is mainly for these very low sounds here. So you can see with this sort of wave, we've got it at 90 hertz, but then we're multiplying it by 0 0.5. And then on top of that, we're also pitch shifting it here, minus six semitones. So it's a very low frequency. The idea of using these bi-quad filters to high pass up to, as you can see here, 30 hertz, is to essentially cut out any significant rumble because the idea is I'm not too interested in those very sub frequencies. What I like is those upper harmonics of the sawtooth wave. So I'm cutting out those low rumbles so we're not taking up all that sort of headroom and we're allowing just those harmonics that we're in, interested in, those nice bright harmonics of a sawtooth wave to try and give us that, that nice engine sound essentially. Now coming out of the synth section, out of these bi-quad filters, if you follow these pink audio lines here, eventually they are going to this mono mixer. And in this mono mixer, we're essentially mixing together all of these different oscillators so that we can get the right characteristic eventually coming out of this one pink line, which is being mixed together with the rest of the sounds of this meta sound. So you are attaching the bi-quad filters all the way to this mono mixer, zero to three. Now out of the gain zero, gain one, gain two, gain three, we have multipliers. And at the bottom of these multipliers, we're going into an LFO section. You'll be pleased to know if you're following along, you can just go ahead, select this section, press control C, and you can just drop that over here and attach the bottom of these multipliers into the interp two. And that will be your LFO section already done. We've already made that part. Out of the top of these multipliers, we have these graph inputs. Again, if you ever want to make your graph input look different, you can change it from uh, a slider to a knob like this. Now for 
mixing together things. I quite like it as a slider, so I'm going to pop it back like that. I've named this one Sin 1 Gain for our Synth 1 Gain. I've named this one Sin 2 Underscore Gain for this one. And as you probably guess now, Sin 3 Gain and Sin 4 Gain. You'll notice on my Synth 4 it's zero because I ended up not using the triangle wave. I didn't really like the sound of it. So I just stuck with the sawtooth waves which were being filtered. And I have these processes, so we have 100% 100 of Synth 1, um, 0.45 of Synth 2, so that's 45%, 100% of Synth 3, and again, yeah, 0% of Synth 1, so we've got zero volume essentially going out of this mono mixer for the triangle wave. Now with all of that, we are then going into this mono mixer, we are outputting into this master volume section and then just to make sure we are absolutely certain where this pink line is coming from, if we follow all the way back here, what you'll see is it's coming out of the engine tick section that we've already been through. So this mono mixer going into the top of this mono mixer and then we have the sim section in this side. Then we have two graph inputs. We have a graph input here, which is for the engine noise plus engine tick volume. That's set to two, so 200%. And then out of the gain one linear, this is our synth section. We have engine synth underscore vol set to 0.15, so 15%. So obviously the synths were very loud. We needed to just temper that volume by bringing this all the way down. And then finally, we're out into the out mono, and that is essentially the meta sound in full. Now, as we come to the player control blueprint, unfortunately, I have run out of time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you what we're going to be doing in the next episode, what I was hoping to do today, but unfortunately, I have run out of time. I have things to do. Um, but in the next episode, we'll be going over this event graph section. So we'll be going over all of this. We have the stop, start, wave player section we'll be going over, which is to do with these triggers here. Make sure that these triggers fire off and make these wave players work correctly. We have the crossfading section, which is essentially crossfading all of these wave players here. Make sure we hear the ones we're meant to hear. And we have the modulation system, which is taking care of essentially the pitch shifting for the wave players. It's taking care of the engine fizz control, the LFOs, uh, essentially all of those sort of modulation areas. So the bi-quad filters, for instance, on the synths, that's essentially what this modulation section is. So we're going to be going through all of that in the next episode. My apologies, I couldn't do it all today. I've just run out of time. But anyway, with that, thank you very much for watching. I'll catch you next time.